This is continuing our talk on Unit 6, uh, starches. Uh, the next most important starch that we talk about is the sweet potato. Sweet potatoes, again, are native to tropical Americas. They were brought back to Europe by the first Spanish explorers, and even Christopher Columbus had a sweet potato when he came back. They also have been domesticated for thousands of years uh, before Christ. Uh, they were also, just like the regular potato, a terrific source uh, of food. A little bit different than uh, the regular white potatoes is that if you notice here, all these little hairs that come out here, and this is how they were propagated. Uh, whereas the regular potato had little eyes on them, these have little hairs on them, and all you gotta do is cut that area out and you'll get a new potato. Um, many people have seen this growing in your kitchen. Uh, your mothers may have taken this and set it on toothpicks and water, and these little fine roots come out there. From each of those little areas, you can produce a new plant. Just like the white potato, they're extremely easy to grow. If you look at the soil right here, it's not particularly good. Uh, there's actually little rocks in it, um, yet it doesn't matter for the, these potatoes. They grow just about every place. Uh, we have st strived to see how did the sweet potato get to other areas because as the explorers went around the world, they found sweet potatoes. When Magellan and Cook went into the South Pacific, they found islands where the sweet potato was one of the main crops. When people started to explore deepest parts of Africa, they found the sweet potato there and they could not figure out how they got there. Well, um, back in the, um, uh, around 1947, uh, Thor Heyerdahl built a raft made out of balsa wood, made out of grasses, and sailed from the South America, reaching the islands in the South Pacific in 101 days. They wanted to show that the prevailing winds and, what, however, the boat building skills of the Peruvians allowed them to explore that far out. And of course, they brought sweet potatoes with them. He also did the same thing uh, across the uh, Atlantic in a boat made out of papyrus to show that even the Egyptians could have sailed to the Americas long before Christopher Columbus did. Uh, as you know now, this is a very highly debated topic. Who discovered the Americas? Uh, and we've shown that many, many years before Christopher Columbus, people have been in uh, North America as well as South America. It may well be that all the materials for tin uh, were taken from uh, Minnesota by the Polynesian, not the Polynesian, but the uh, Phoenicians sailing all the way from the Mediterranean to the Great Lakes and back. A lot of sweet potatoes are being produced. The largest, of course, is with China. Uh, remember, of course, they have the largest population also. There's a lot of this uh, for their livestock. Uh, Solomon Islands, we eat 160 kilograms per person per year. Uh, North Carolina is the U.S. state with the highest sweet potato production. The next start that's out there is something called the cassava or the maniac. You might recognize this now as what's seen in tapioca pudding. This map here shows where in the world uh, this was extensively cultivated and where is it a major source of carbohydrates and starches. Here's the plant over here again, and uh, you can see, again, this big root structure where they store all the starches, all the food that's always needed. And again, the soil here is not very good. Uh, all these places that it's from, uh, especially places over here in uh, Africa, the soil is very poor. But what they discovered is they can just stick a part of the stem into this and a new plant will grow. Here's the stems out here. 
This is another starch that has come from Brazil and Paraguay. Uh, the, and then sailed all the way over it to the other parts of the world. Again, this was found early on, so there must have been some sort of vessels which traveled between Africa and Brazil long before Christopher Columbus. This is slightly different because it is propagated from stem cuttings. You just take the stem, cut it, let it dry out, stick it in the ground, and uh, Two or three months later, you'll have plants that you can eat. The difficulties arising from cassava production is that it has cyanide in it. Ancient people have learned various techniques to get rid of the cyanide. I'm sure there was a lot of trial and error review. Some people learn to grind it up into fine particles, treat it with water. Some people learn to cut it up and leave it out in the sun. So there's many, many different ways to get rid of this. You could always tell when people were eating untreated uh, cassava plants by the they would walk with particularly jittery motion. And this was due to cyanide poisoning. Different techniques have arisen both in Africa, South America, uh, India, Asia, to get rid of this uh, cyanide. Uh, bananas are another big starch containing plant. Uh, here's a picture of the uh, bananas here. And here's the flower down at the end right here. Uh, these are grown all over the world. They rank fourth after rice, wheat, and maize in human consumption. They are grown in 130 countries worldwide, more than any other food crop. It's hard to imagine that these are actually grown in Iceland. Iceland is a banana exporting country. And this is because of the large amount of geothermal activity in Iceland. There's huge expanses of greenhouses there under which bananas are growing, and then consequently exported to the rest of the world. Uh, plant, banana plantations uh, filled up South America. However, they're native to Asia. Uh, Alexander the Great was one of the first Europeans to discover the wonderful taste of bananas and brought back many of them to the Mediterranean area. The bad thing is, is that these particular bananas don't necessarily uh, grow by seeds. When you open up the banana to eat it, you notice all these black spots are there on the inside. It appears to be seeds, and they are seeds, but unfortunately they're sterile seeds. So what has to happen is we have to propagate that another way. And if you look here, you see these little shoots that are coming out, these little shoots that are coming out right here. What has to be done is they are dug up, they're separated from the plant, and then grown in another area. It typically takes about two years for this to form, and after this is formed, the plant uh, will wither away. Again, they can grow in just about every country in the world as long as they're protected from freezing. Uh, right now, we have a threat against them, which is the fusophilium wilt. Uh, if you remember from chapter two, we talked about the xylem and phloem being the arteries and veins of plants. And this particular organism will get in there and block the xylem. So if the xylem is blocked, remember the xylem is going upwards, the phloem is going down, the plant then cannot uptake water and cannot take any of the stored materials that were in the roots up into the plant. So the plant will die. Uh, the yam is another big starch storage plant. Uh, we hear a lot about this at Thanksgiving and Easter and Christmas. And we get confused, especially in the United States, between sweet potatoes and yams. Uh, there are two varieties of sweet potatoes, one which is a little sweeter than the others, which most American people confuse with yams. The yams is completely different. Uh, they're members of the genus uh, Dioscorea, 
and again, uh, we find these rather than in South America and West Africa and New Guinea. These were actually from Africa and Asia. Uh, again, just like the potatoes, we found them uh, four to 5,000 years before Christ. We found evidence with cultivation of all of them, possibly as much as 10,000 years ago when we first started agriculture in the different regions of the world. Yams are extremely important in these areas because just like the sweet potato, just like the cassava, they're very easy to grow. You can stick them in the ground and leave them. You come back in uh, six, seven months, you can dig them up. One of the best benefits about yams is that you can leave them in the ground without refrigeration. So they can be ready to be dug up, left there, and then come back and eat them so it's a good place for people who don't have refrigerators a way to stock them. Thing about them is that they also have some chemicals in them which we're not quite sure about that seems to support the, the lung, the kidney, and the spleen. Uh, it has other chemicals in there which seem to help with stress, help with cholesterol, has help with estrogens. They also found that um, Many of the women who are taking a large amount of yams would not even become pregnant because it turns out they have something in there which are precursors for manufacturing progesterone and other steroid drinks. So the women who had a lot of this didn't become pregnant. Taro is another tropical plant that is grown primarily for the corn which again is that storage organism uh, that we see over here. Again, a hard, firm uh, storage organ. And uh, again, this was another plant that we had to explore by trial and error how it could be good for us. Uh, taro is even better because not only can we have the uh, um, storage system we can also eat the leaves, the flowers. All plants of this are edible, and if you've ever been to the South Pacific, you'll find that when they have their uh, traditional uh, meals out there. What they have discovered, though, by trial and error, is that if you just chew it, it tastes terrible. And it's not because of the taste, it's because of the sharp projectiles in here, which are raphides. If you remember in uh, Unit 1, we just discussed how raphides can last a long time in their give us indication what plant was in what area as we study the history of plants. Taro has been in the South Pacific again for thousands of years. Uh, why I said these big farms where they grow them, uh, even have flooded areas where you flood into them to um, wash them away. You'll find that uh, as they cook them and they make poi, um, they have to get be cooked in a certain way uh, and order to to eat them. Uh, traditionally, you find things that are wrapped in uh, the leaves. They may take a whole pig, vegetables, wrap them in the taro leaves, and cover them in fire and bury them for a multiple hours, and sometimes days, dig them up, and that is going to be their, their big meal. Uh, the, the last one I would like to talk about is the Jerusalem wire choke, sometimes this is called the sun root, sun choke. Uh, this is one of the few plants that are native to North America. Uh, this along with the cranberry, this along with the sunflower, and possibly the blueberry are the only edible plants that are actually native to North America. This was found by the uh, French as they came over here and started exploring. Uh, the Native Americans uh, used them for years. The French, when they came there, wanted to honor both uh, the Christian world at that time, and they resembled a little bit artichokes, so they called them Jerusalem artichokes. Again, they're very easy to cultivate, and uh, sometimes uh, they're very weed-like in character. Remember, weeds are actually plants that are disliked because they're just too invasive. They can take over an entire area. When you dig up a Jerusalem artichoke, you must remove everything. Uh, 
because even the small pea stem were left in the ground, um, making a, a new plant out of this. Uh, so this is some examples of uh, the way plants store food as starches. Thank you.